I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back again, everyone across the universe. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode, the 303rd, eh, more or less. If you don't mind, I thought we might take another trip down the epic China history timeline from ancient to modern times and use the prism of one of China's most historic and consequential cities, the city of Guangzhou, to tell the story. Guangzhou, I'm proud to say, going back to December 8, 1981, is the sister city of this town I call home, Los Angeles, California. Yeah, on that date, the... Then mayors of L.A. and Guangzhou, Tom Bradley and Liang Lingguang, signed the Sister City Agreement at the iconic L.A. City Hall building. We just celebrated 40 years of friendship. So it's with particular pleasure that I get to present this topic to you. As a youngin, growing up in the North Chicago suburbs, I knew about the city of Guangzhou because of its other name, Canton. In the USA, at least, those of us who didn't grow up living with Chinese culture, weren't aware of the Guangzhou name. Guangzhou as a place name didn't start being bandied about until after the Nixon visit in 1972. So those who didn't know any better, me and my family included, knew this place as Canton. Canton, Cantonese food, Cantonese people. I can't even remember a time when that name wasn't part of my consciousness. You could say, for so many people, in the West at least, before China began opening up in the 1980s, the country was defined by this city that we will explore over the next few episodes, however long it takes. In this part one episode, we'll try and make it to at least the Tang Dynasty. Chinese civilization began in the north, along the Yellow River and its many tributaries, When you look at a map of the most ancient dynasties, the Shang and Zhou, even at their greatest extent, China hardly went below the Yangtze River. South of that greatest river in China were the Baiyue people, the Hundred Yue. That was a catch-all term to describe these indigenous folk who had called all of southern China, from Yunnan to the China coast, their home, going back to Neolithic times. And they didn't recognize any of the political borders we know of in our day. The Bai Yue also spilled over into northern Vietnam, populating the Red River Valley and adjacent areas. In fact, the Viet in Vietnam comes from this word, Yue. They were not at all like the Chinese of the North. A different language, different customs, different artistic aesthetic, dress, ways they adorn their person, different weapons and styles of fighting. They were a seafaring people who engaged in commerce between their lands and the north of China. They were also heavily engaged in the Nanhai Sea Trade. The Nanhai was the South China Sea. You'll hear this term constantly. When the Shang Dynasty ruins at Yin near Anyang were discovered, they found a lot of these cowrie shells that had come from the south. No one's sure exactly how they got there, but it's suggested that someone brought them up to the Shang Palace as tribute or as an article of trade. Because of their proximity, it's been suggested that there was some interaction between the Shang civilization and tribes from among these hundred Yue. Guangzhou's Neolithic history went back about 7,000 years to 5,000 BC, which is par for the course in most places in the world. It was the time on this planet when we humans stopped wandering and commenced the systematic husbandry of plants and animals. This large area of land, of which Guangzhou is just one part, became known as the Lingnan region, and the culture practice there was, and still is, referred to as Lingnan culture. Lingnan, south of the Nanling Mountains, that's the range that 
separates the Pearl River Basin from the Yangtze River Valley. It stretched from about Guilin in the west to Ganzhou in the east, Jiangxi province. The Lingnan region, and all the good things that became part of the culture, mainly covers parts of the territories of Guangxi, Guangdong, and northern Vietnam. Hainan is also considered to be under the umbrella of Lingnan culture, as are the Diochus, Hakas, and Zhuangs. In popular usage, Lingnan culture and Cantonese Hong Kong Macau culture are used interchangeably. But Lingnan is so much more. The culture of this Lingnan area, when it began to blend with the northern Huaxia Chinese culture that had already been developing for over a thousand years, evolved into something new. So this was Lingnan, and to the north was the Jiangnan region, south of the Changjiang, the Yangtze River. Essentially Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Shanghai, Anhui, most of Hunan, and southeast Hubei. You've heard this Jiangnan term many times in past episodes. The earliest incarnation of the city of Guangzhou was known as Chuting. This was during the time of the Zhou Dynasty King Yi, 887 BC. Chu State had attacked the Yue in the south, who, for political reasons, submitted to Chu and became a tribute state. And this base in Chuting it wasn't a city or even a town, it was more like a stockade. But people who lived in and around this Chuting settlement where the city of Guangzhou is today, as the legend goes, they one day fell on hard times. The scourge of early humankind, bad weather, led to a famine, and people were dying. And then at the most desperate moment of the people's suffering, descending from the heavens were five celestial beings riding on the backs of five rams or goats, The character Yang can mean either one. They brought famine relief in the form of rice, and from this legend, Guangzhou acquired its names of Yangcheng, the city of rams, and also Suicheng, the city of rice. Although Sui means an ear of grain, which could mean corn too. And from here on out in historical writings, the character Sui will serve as an abbreviation for the city of Guangzhou, Many of you are familiar with the character Yue that acts as an abbreviation for the province of Guangdong. This character is found on all the Guangdong registered license plates. And this is different from the Yue character used for the Bai Yue people and the country of Vietnam, or Yue Nan. During the spring and autumn period of the Eastern Zhou, a walled town was constructed at a place called Nan Wu Cheng. This was in the northern part of modern-day Guangzhou, 339 to 329 BC, Warring States period, the city was expanded and became known as Wuyangcheng, the city of five rams. And into our day, this Wuyang, or five rams motif, could still be seen in all kinds of ways in our day, driving around the city of Guangzhou. And this earliest town or crude settlement that began in the Zhou, this is what grew into the city of Panyu, Geographically, Panyu borders the city of Guangzhou to the south. It's accessible via the Pearl River estuary that flows into the South China Sea. Since ancient times, this stretch of water had always been the center of attention once maritime trade started up. From the South China Sea, countless vessels sailed into the mouth of the Pearl River. And these traders would first sail past the city of Human, known as the Bogue. Then one sailed up the Shirtze Yang, the Lion Ocean. And then they came to Panyu. And as I just said, adjacent to Panyu came Guangzhou. Today, Panyu is a district of Guangzhou, but more than 2,000 years before, Panyu was the location where Guangzhou history began. Between the unification of China by Qin Shi Huang in 221 BC and the year 214 BC, the first emperor sent five military campaigns to subdue the Bai Yue. There were only maybe four main Yue tribes that were the holdouts. The Min Yue in Fujian, the Ou Yue in southern Zhejiang, they were also called the Dong Ou, Uh, they were based in Wenzhou. There was also the Nan Yue in Guangdong, Guangxi, 
and the Luo Yue, or Lac Viet, in the Red River Valley of northern Vietnam, where present-day Hanoi is located. And it was in the year 214 B.C., 2,236 years ago as I speak, that the Bai Yue were pacified by the Qin military. And starting in the 3rd century B.C., their assimilation into the Chinese Empire began. But as it was with all these indigenous people who populated southern China below the Yangtze, they all assimilated, but in the process, there was plenty of their Yue culture that flowed in the other direction and rubbed off on the northern Chinese Huaxia culture that would ultimately triumph over the unified nation. One of the skills the Yue brought to the Chinese in the 3rd century BC was their sailing and navigation expertise. The Qin emperor called for 36 commanderies to be established around his empire and where he based his armies. And these commanderies became the tip of the spear that was tasked to look after this growing empire. And the commandery down in Guangzhou was called the Nanhai Commandery. And it was right there in modern-day Panyu district that the first emperor of China in 214 BC, after his conquest of the Baiyue tribes, set up this base, the Nanhai Commandery, southern Guangdong. And then all the way from the north to the South China Sea, all became part of the same Chinese empire. And though the city of Guangzhou can reach back all the way to the time of the earliest settlements of Chu Ting, Nan Wu Cheng, and Yang Cheng, it was really during the Qin, and especially the Han, that followed, where Guangzhou history begins, in the 3rd century BC. According to the Huainan Zi, one of the more ancient texts that came out during the Han, one reason why the Qin court was so hot to conquer the South was because of the trade in exotica, and luxuries. This fueled much of the early trade. The Nanhai trade was all about these precious commodities. Ready access to all this was demanded by the imperial court to add to the splendor of the emperor's palace and for his tomb. This is what drove the Qin emperor to conquer and control these lands at all costs. Now, this might be a lot of rehash from the CHP 197 episode on the relations between China and Vietnam, but the general who Qin Shi Huang put in charge of the Nanhai commandery in 208 BC was named Zhao Tuo. He came down to the south and got all settled in at his position at the Nanhai commandery, and then suddenly the Qin dynasty just up and died. The first Qin emperor passed in 210 BC, and his son only lasted a couple of years following the whole sordid affair with Zhao Gao, Li Si, Hu Hai, Fu Su, Meng Tian, and Zi Ying. By 206 BC, China's first dynasty was done in. And with no one in charge up in the capital, Xianyang, Zhao Tuo cut bait with the dynasty and became a renegade general and took matters into his own hands. All the lands of the Nanhai commandery of China were turned into a new kingdom. And Zhao Tuo called this kingdom Nan Yue. And as soon as he established this kingdom, Zhao Tuo's forces went in and put a dramatic end to the Olak kingdom down in Vietnam. Not called Vietnam yet, of course. And his troops captured present-day Hanoi and the surrounding Red River Delta region. And all of this got folded into this new Nan Yue kingdom. Zhao Tuo set up his capital at Panyu, again conveniently located southeast of Guangzhou. And the Nanyue Palace was, it was discovered in 1995, and it's being excavated as we speak. Just east of People's Park in the center of Guangzhou lies the archaeological site where Zhao Tuo ruled his kingdom. And because Zhao Tuo hailed from Shijiazhuang, he began to transform Nanyue, bringing to this region all that good and great Zhou Dynasty culture, the stem cells, so to speak, for all the richness of Chinese civilization that followed. The Qin Dynasty hadn't lasted long, but there was still plenty of good that came out of it. Everything that Zhao Tuo introduced to his Nanyue kingdom didn't transform that place into a northern-style Chinese kingdom. The indigenous Yue culture that had been around for thousands of years itself blended with everything Zhao Tuo was introducing to this Lingnan region. 
In fact, later on in the Han Dynasty, these imperial envoys who came down to meet with the king of Nanyue will be kind of shocked at the strangeness of the customs they observed. According to the historical record, Chao Tuo lived till 103 years of age, dying in 137 BC. But prior to Chao Tuo's passing, eh, who could ever forget one of the great stories from ancient Chinese history following the fall of the Qin, the two most powerful political and military figures in the land, Liu Bang of Han and Xiang Yu of Chu, engaged in their historic contention for supremacy and to wear the mantle of Qin Shi Huang as a dynasty founder. And when the last battle was fought at Gai Xia in northern Anhui in 202 BC, Liu Bang prevailed. And once he founded the Han Dynasty, Liu Bang, or Emperor Gaozu, he had some serious expansion plans, which included the return of these renegade commanderies established by the previous dynasty founder. Despite that, Zhao Tuo defied the Han Emperor, who was quite determined to have him swear his allegiance to the Han to deal with this impasse caused by Zhao Tuo's unwillingness to bend the knee to Han Gaozu. The emperor sent his most trusted official, Lu Jia, down to the Nanyue capital in Panyu to work on Zhao Tuo and talk some sense into him. 196 BC, Lu Jia met face to face with Zhao Tuo, and they worked out a kind of deal whereby Zhao Tuo would be able to remain a king, but he had to acknowledge Han Gaozu as the emperor. In other words, they weren't equals, or even primus inter pares. That kept everything bearable for 13 years until 183 BC when, taking advantage of the unrest following the death of Emperor Gaozu, Chao Tuo declared himself the Nan Wu Di, the Nan Yue warrior emperor, like Han Wu Di later on. Now, there was a world of difference between being a king and being an emperor. An emperor could talk directly with heaven. A king, eh, heaven didn't bother with him. So once again, Zhao Tuo's presumption of equality antagonized the Han court, and Lu Jia made his second trip down to the south to try and bring Zhao Tuo back to his senses. The kingdom of Nan Yue had become a threat to Han China's southern border, and Nan Yue armies had even gone on the offensive, making incursions into Chinese territory. However, in 179 BC, Zhao Tuo, to keep the peace and hedge his bets, strategically dropped the Nan Wu Di title. Then came the splendid reigns of Han emperors Wen and Qing, a time of great peace and prosperity. And for a while, at least, relations were also peaceful between the Nan Yue Kingdom and China. But Zhao Tuo died in 137 BC and was succeeded by his grandson, Zhao Mo. As Dan Quayle was no Jack Kennedy, eh, the same could be said about Zhao Mo. He was no Zhao Tuo and was under his watch that Nan Yue returned to the China fold. The beginning of the end came when the Minyue of Fujian province had invaded Nanyue and became a clear and present danger to Emperor Zhao Mo. So, in a time-honored tradition from here on out, this grandson of Zhao Tuo ran to the Chinese emperor for military assistance to aid in defeating these antagonists from Fujian who were trying to take him down. And as part of the deal... In exchange for Han China's military help and in intervening, Zhao Mo declared his kingdom to be a vassal of Han China. And to show his sincerity, he sent his own son to the Han court in Chang'an as a hostage. And true to their word, the Han army went in and got the Minyue to back off from invading Nanyue. The Minyue will remain in the picture until the end of the Han, beginning of the Three Kingdoms period before they join all the other Yue tribes who succumb to Chinese invasion. Ultimately, as it was in the U.S. during the 19th century and the conquering of all the Native American tribes and nations, the Yue became part of a new and expanding, bigger nation. And when Zhao Mo died in 122 B.C., his son, the one he had sent to Chang'an as a hostage, he became the third emperor of Nanyue after the death of Zhao Mo. And this new emperor, Ying Qi, 
was permitted to return to Nanyue. By the way, 21 centuries after the death of the second Nanyue Emperor Zhao Mo, construction workers in Guangzhou stumbled onto his tomb in 1983 in the Yueshio district of the city. Today, you could see artifacts from Zhao Mo's tomb at the Xi Han Nanyue Wang Bo Wu Guan, the Western Han Nanyue King Museum. You can go check out Zhao Mo's jade burial suit. Pretty cool if you never saw one of those. Yeah, a lot of people today walking around Guangzhou every day eh, dig down deep enough from every direction. It's one massive archaeological site waiting to be explored. As I said, this third Nanyue King, Zhao Yingqi, 122 to 115 BC, he was the eldest son of Zhao Mo. He's mainly remembered as a ruthless, bloodthirsty tyrant who murdered his own citizens. Uh, not the first and not the last one in history to do that. The Nanyue kingdom turned a corner here, and by this third emperor's time, it was decidedly in a downward trajectory. By the time of the fourth emperor, uh, it was one of those emperor's dowager, child emperor kind of things, which rarely, if ever, ends well. In the end, it came down to a Nanyue prime minister, Lu Jia, not Lu Jia, the great Confucian scholar official who dealt with Zhao Tuo on behalf of Han Gaozu, this Liu Jia, he hatched a conspiracy that led to the murder of both the young Nanyue emperor and the emperor's dowager. Liu Jia thereupon put the emperor's brother on the throne, and feeling invincible, he then declared war on the Han Empire. The Nanyue army, after managing to rebuff Chinese attempts at working things out diplomatically, and after defeating Han forces in a limited battle, earned the wrath of the Han Emperor Wu, not anyone you should mess around with. So he sent six armies marching south, about 100,000 troops, down to Nanyue. After taking the capital at Panyu, the forces of Nanyue were defeated in the milestone year in Guangzhou history of 111 B.C. Liu Jia and the fifth Nanyue king, Jian De, were captured, and for daring to defy Emperor Wu, those two ended up getting the head displayed on the end of a pike treatment. Once Nanyue was taken, this set off another wave of Han Chinese migrants from the north. The sinification process was still going on down there. Nanyue, including all those former Aulak lands in northern and central Vietnam, were annexed to Han China. And that marked the end of Nanyue and the start of the first period of domination by China in Vietnam, which lasted from 111 BC to 39 AD. And for almost a thousand years thereafter, there was an on-again, off-again period of Chinese domination of northern Vietnam. And it lasted from 111 BC all the way up to 938, after the bloody and messy end of the Tang Dynasty in China. Not that long after Nanyue was subdued by the almighty Han army, the long-reigning Emperor Wu died. This was in 87 BC. And one of the legacies he left behind down in the Lingnan region, Guangzhou included, was the imperial government takeover of foreign trade at the port. Up to the time of Emperor Wu, you could say all of the Nanhai trade had been managed and controlled by the traders and merchant class. But for something this important, the government muscled in and took it over. And rather than all those profits lining the pockets of the merchant class, they henceforth went in the direction of the government's coffers. And this income flow helped a great deal in funding Han Wu Di's expansion plans and those of many an emperor to follow and the unprecedented income that came with being China's largest port in the South China Sea, over the next thousand years or so, became a ceaseless tug-of-war between the local, provincial, and central government for the lion's share of those riches. Now it was Guangzhou's turn to join the greatest and most historic ports of its time, Cannabis in Alexandria, Chittagong in Bangladesh, Ostia Antica in Rome, as well as Mombasa, Zanzibar, Mogadishu, and Kilwa. Today, and I guess for the past three decades going back to Gaika Kaifeng, reform and opening, Guangdong province has consistently been the richest region in China. And this all goes back to Han Wu Di, who, I think, 
has gotten more mentions in the CHP than any other leader. He took China to a very good place during his long reign. And now with Guangzhou established as the principal port at the southern end of China, a steady income source for the treasury could be counted on. Pan Yu became a major trading entrepot, the first Canton Fair of its kind, you could say. And this is how Guangzhou's role as a major center for trade and commerce first had its humble beginnings. Total GDP today at the port of Guangzhou is about a quarter trillion USD. You had to start somewhere, and the Western Han Dynasty was where you could say everything began to happen at a much faster clip. The period of assimilation and sinicization that began during the Han took a few centuries before you could notice a change. As the Han fell and the Three Kingdoms period began, it was the Kingdom of Wu that controlled all of southern and eastern China, the Jiangnan and Lingnan regions. From about the Yangtze River north, this part of China was controlled by the Kingdom of Wei. Shu, of course, was west of Wu and south of Wei and based its capital in the city of Chengdu. So because of its geography, the history of Guangzhou during the Three Kingdoms, 220 to 280, was folded into the history of Wu and its great leader Sun Quan. And we all have Sun Quan to thank for giving us the name of this historic city. It was in 226 AD. That's when the city was first referred to as Guangzhou. Back then, a prefecture was called a Zhou, so it's more correctly called Guang Prefecture. The capital, still, was based in Panyu. Here's where it all began, 3rd century AD. This is when Guangzhou, even more so than during Han Wu Di's time, became the great trading entrepot that we're all familiar with. This is where the Persian... Arab and Indian traders started showing up in much greater numbers, and with so much trade being conducted, as I just said, a great deal of wealth was being created, and with all the profits being generated from this trade, almost exclusively still in big-ticket luxury items, it attracted not only more seafaring merchants, but Chinese officials as well to regulate it. Most of us are familiar with the Hapo and the Kohong of the late Qing, who regulated all the trade with the foreign traders. Their scale of corruption and the wealth they amassed was legendary. We'll get to them later on. And as you'll clearly see, by the time of the Qing, soaking the merchants trading at Guangzhou was nothing new. The most ancient ancestors of these Kohong trade officials of the Canton system, they did the same thing. As trading vessels started arriving from farther away than the South China Sea, the volume of business began to expand at such a rate that more officials needed to be sent down to regulate it. Later on in the Tang, their avarice would be immortalized in the official histories and in other documents from that period that attested to the corruption of some of these trade officials in Guangzhou. One went, quote, All those in Nanhai cannot carry their extravagance through the doors when they return. Another one went, quote, the governor of Guangzhou need only pass through the city gates just once, and he will be enriched by 30 million strings of cash. And because northern Vietnam, called Jiao Zhe back in Sun Quan's day during the Three Kingdoms period, because that land was now part of the Wu Kingdom, it too became another trading port for foreign merchants to call on. In fact, this was the gateway for many vessels that sailed the South China Sea. Coming from the west, no matter the Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal, you came upon the Vietnam coast before you hit Guangzhou, and the port of Zhaozhe in time became a competing market with Guangzhou for the trade in exotica and other highly sought-after commodities. In fact, some of you might recall in that part one episode on Sino-Roman relations about the story of Qin Lun from Byzantium who arrived in 226 making landfall in Zhaozhe before he was taken up north to meet with Sun Quan, the now emperor of eastern Wu. When the corruption would reach a certain point in Guangzhou, traders would simply take their business to Zhaozhe in Vietnam and would only return when the authorities at Guangzhou tempered their greed. 
During the 4th and 5th centuries, after the fall of the Qin, and after 135 years of the 16 Kingdoms period that witnessed five Liangs, four Yens, three Qins, two Zhaos, a Cheng Han, and a Xia, trade continued to develop, as did the process of assimilation by the local indigenous people. Even as late as the Southern and Northern Dynasties period, 5th, 6th centuries, the Guangzhou region was still, despite their relatively small numbers, heavily populated by the Yue people. To the cultured northerners, this far south was still considered a wild and dangerous place whose main value to the empire was as a portal for all the luxury items so coveted by the emperors and their fellow royals. In the early 6th century, especially after the reign of Liang Dynasty founder Emperor Wu, the Nanhai trade began to take on a different look and feel. Among other claims to fame, Liang Wu Di was a very devout Buddhist, and his imperial sponsorship of this new religion, being embraced by the Chinese in such great numbers, did wonders for its propagation. Rather than all these traditional luxury items destined for the palaces, trade began to branch out into all of the various commodities required to build Buddhist temples and to adorn them. Guangxiao Temple in Guangzhou was one of the most important temples and had a history that went back all the way to the Jin. When the age of Buddhist pilgrimages was in full swing, this was a very popular stop along the tour. It's got a long history in Guangzhou, and it's still around in the Yuexiao district. Long before the Portuguese, Dutch, and British started showing up, Guangzhou was a home away from home for traders from the Near East who sailed from ports in the Persian Gulf. The Arab sailors had discovered the monsoon winds that made this long and perilous journey to the South China Sea possible. This was how trade was able to commence over long distances so early in history. With the predictability of these wind patterns during certain times of the year, as well as all that had been learned of celestial navigation, Nature worked hand-in-hand hand with these sea merchants to facilitate the first international trade. The Persians at first dominated this trade, but Arab traders, embarking from Basra and other ports, began making their way to the South China Sea. And the Arabs called the city of Guangzhou, Kanfu. We can see how Guangzhou became important as a mart for the Nanhai trade that was first carried out by Austronesian peoples from Southeast Asia, Polynesia, Micronesia, New Guinea, and Madagascar in the West. Guangzhou and the surrounding environs, as a port where people came to trade, these most ancient merchants were the ones who started it all. Then came the Maritime Silk Road, which was laid on top of everything these earliest traders had built. Arabs, Persians, and Indians, mostly Tamil, made their way in the direction of China for centuries. And this all long predated the arrival of those who came from Europe a thousand or more years later. We're now coming to the Sui and Tang period, late 6th century. The Maritime Silk Road is going to come into its own, and the trade in luxury goods in the direction of Chang'an, and to all the fine residences of the Tang elites and the expanding rich capitalist class went far beyond anything that had ever been seen before. And even before the Tang, there were foreigners who, because of trade, because of Buddhism, or for other reasons, resided in Guangzhou, and the tradition of keeping foreigners separate from the local Chinese population, well, it didn't start in the Qing dynasty. In Guangzhou, a fanfang, or foreign enclave, or ghetto, came into being, a place where all the foreigners lived, and the resident merchants and faithful in the fanfang were led by a fanjang, who represented them in all matters related to the local government authorities. With the completion of the Grand Canal, the signature achievement of the Sui dynasty emperors, Guangzhou took on even more importance. Although Guangzhou was far from the capital in the north and distant from Hangzhou as well, the Grand Canal nonetheless brought them closer than they had ever been to the historic north where China began. The demand and flow of luxury products to the most splendiferous imperial court in the 7th century world required a 
never-ending supply of aromatic and exotic hardwoods, cinnamon and other spices, ivory, rhino horn, tortoise shells, kingfisher, peacock, and other feathers from exotic birds, pearls, and gems. Further to this was the demand for articles destined for the Buddhist temples popping up all across the country from north to south. And I want to reiterate all this trade, the part that flowed through Canton, the city of Guangzhou, it was all controlled and regulated as much as it would be a thousand years later during the Qing. The Tang government divided up the empire into a number of circuits, or Dao, and these Tang circuits would be equivalent to a province. They began as commanderies from Qin Shi Huang's time. Guangzhou was located in the Lingnan circuit, the Lingnan Dao. This term, Lingnan, We already discussed how this name came about, but later on, during the Song Dynasty, in 971, the Lingnan Circuit was given a makeover, and those lands were divided up into the Guangnan East and Guangnan West Circuits. East is pronounced Dong, and West is Xi. That's where we get Guangdong and Guangxi from this appellation given during the Song Of course, the Mongols will come along, and during the Yuan Dynasty, those two places will be split up again with southeast Hubei, Hunan, Guangxi, Guizhou, and southwest Guangdong becoming part of the new Huguang province. And the rest of Guangdong, including Guangzhou, became part of Jiangxi province. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. Why don't we just gather up our things and just call it a day for now? In part two, we'll look at how much Guangzhou prospered during the Tang Dynasty. By then, it truly became an international city, much as it is today. Though, of course, back then, it was on a much smaller scale. Maritime trade started off slow in BC times, but gathered momentum throughout the earliest Chinese dynasties. So, please do consider coming back for more next time. The Tang, Five Dynasties, Ten Kingdoms, Song, Yuan, Ming. Still lots more to come in our little overview of the History of the Great City of Guangzhou and the Greater Guangdong Province. I'll throw that in at no additional charge. And one last thing. If you like what I'm doing, I hope you'll consider supporting the show. You can visit my website at teacup.media and click on support. and You'll see a bunch of different ways to assist me. Patreon, CHP Premium will get you this program ad-free with plenty of other bonus content and perks. Well, if that ain't your thing, there's other ways as well. I hope you'll consider that. And once more, let me remind you that at the website for each episode, I post downloadable PDF documents listing all the Chinese terms used. You're welcome to go check that out. It's a free service for all of you from all of us here at Teacup Media. So until the next time, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from hotter than usual Southern California. It's safe to say from the dearth of rain that fell on the Southland this winter that it's going to be a baking hot, bone dry summer ahead. Worst drought in 1,200 years, they're telling us. I may have to move my CHP office to Hermosa Beach for the summer. Take care, everyone, and I'm as thankful as I ever am for your listenership. If you know what's good for you, please come back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.